Okay, getting right back into it. Have you noticed the Pac-Man on the side of Klonoa's hat yet? It's just a Pac-Man type of month on this channel, isn't it? Namco better be careful though, that looks uh, eerily similar to uh, a religious symbol that, uh, that you can't have in any kind of fictional media. I bet you're surprised that I know about that one. And speaking of cultural differences, I bet you, the dumbass viewer with no teeth, did not know... <laughs> Why would I say such a thing? I bet you didn't know that in Japan, uh, Klonoa was actually called something slightly different. The title that they gave it over there uh, roughly translates to uh, Klonoa of the Wind. And then for the, uh, the American localization, they, uh, they just shortened it to Klonoa. I guess they thought that would make it more appealing to 90s dude bros and backwards hats. They would have been offended by wind. And then for the uh, the European uh, localization, I don't know what they did with that, but I'm assuming they probably did something dumb. They probably called it like a uh, Klonoa featuring CNN's Tulu Olorunapa. Why would they call it that? Anyway, um... So this uh, collection, this is a collection of two games that I'm playing, by the way. So this collection has two out of three of the Klonoa games in this style. There's one more that they did not include that launched with the GBA originally. And then aside from that, there are a few Klonoa spin-offs, but there are really only three that have the, the proper 2D platforming style. I learned about the GBA Klonoa game from a a stream channel that makes really good content. They're called uh, Retro Pales. I haven't kept up with them for uh, for a long time, but the, there's definitely some quality content over at Retro Pales. The, they had an episode once where they played the uh, the demo disc for Shenmue, not the game itself, but the uh, the demo disc while the game was still in development, and there were a, a few key visual differences between that and the final game that could be pointed out. Like, for example, when the, the game was still in the early phase of development, they hadn't settled for how detailed Ryo Hazuki's model should be. And as a result, in the demo version, it's much more detailed than it is in the final, to the point where you can see all of Ryo Hazuki's individual teeth. So yeah, the, on Retro Pales, they find all co kinds of interesting trivia like that, and Stuff that's far too obscure for those flaming homosexuals at Did You Know Gaming and their extremely basic trivia. Did you know that Mario is... Checks notes. Italian? Ooh. Yeah, if you want some real hardcore gaming stuff, give Retro Pales a look. Ah uh, yes, I love that feature where the uh, enemies have a 1 in 1,000 chance of making a TF2 death sound when you kill them. Really makes you, the player, contemplate the choices that you've made. Maybe you didn't have to kill all these enemies, hmm? Listen to me, I'm sounding like a damn fool. It's like some goofy article once where they said the, uh, the best new feature in gaming is to, to have benches that the player can sit on so they can think about their actions. You know, if gaming hadn't opened up to normies, we wouldn't have to put up with all this just stupid bullshit. I mean, good lord, who writes this kind of stuff? So any hoodles? As we go through these lush, vibrant landscapes and these, uh, these wonderfully pretty graphics, here's something for you to consider about this game's design philosophy and why it turned out the way it did. When this game and the one before it were in development, the design philosophy was that they should try to do the opposite of what was trendy in the industry at the time, you see. Because, well, not, not this one so much, but the first one would have been developed during the, uh, the PS1 era at a time when 3D was the hot new thing and games were trying to be more dark and cool and edgy and what have you. 
So they tried to do the opposite of that by having a 2D game that was vibrant and colorful and pretty to look at. And how did it work out for them by trying to do the opposite of what everybody else was doing? Well, the series has had three games over the course of 25 years, so uh, what do you think, viewer? Yeah, you gotta be careful around the, uh, the plant man here. You gotta throw in an enemy to bait him. But then if you're too close, you'll get pulled in with him. The plant man is a tricky beast. How do you think furries feel about Klonoa? I would imagine this is the exact type of thing that would really uh, get their attention. I mean, not only does the game stir an anthropomorphic animal, but it also has inflation in it. You know, with the enemies and such. Not one, but two weird internet things together in one game. There's some nasty internet person out there who just recently discovered these games with the uh, release of the remakes, and I'm sure they're just over the moon. Just some 36-year-old man who still lives with his mom, and he looks at this and... Furries and inflation! <laughs> uh, what a foul image. So here's a, a new-ish character. Kind of looks like uh, something out of Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle. Yeah, that's a reference people are going to get. In a second, you'll get a better look at the character and like her uh, monkey ears and you'll, you'll see what I mean. Yeah, see? Very Alex Kidd-esque. These are the comparisons that people want to hear in 2022. In order to appreciate Alex Kidd references, I think you'd have to be either a 50-year-old man or a cool emulator guy, much like myself. Not exactly entry-level knowledge. So, let's be like all those other cool and funny Let's Players and we'll... Uh, or write a creepy pasta about the game that's currently on screen. This is always fun. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna ad lib a Klonoa creepy pasta right here <clears throat> and right now. Okay, so we're uh, opening music. So uh, Klonoa narrates the scene. He says. Uh, Hi, my name's Klonoa Beaumont, and then it, it cuts to uh, Klonoa lying in bed with his eyes open, and he says, Time to get up. And then it shows uh, Klonoa's uh, human friend, Hale, and he, he says, This is my friend, Hale. He's a sleazy, low life. And together we're Klonoa Rangers. So that's it, huh? That was the Klonoa creepypasta? Where does the creepiness come in exactly? Well, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it going. Let's try to add some creepy stuff in there. So, uh, so, uh, Hale says to, uh, Klonoa, I, I found this book on demonology. You want to summon a demon with me? Eh, uh, see? Demons are creepy. There's something. So then, uh, Klonoa says, Okay, you want to get something to eat first? So then they, uh, it cuts to them at a restaurant, and Klonoa says, Yeah, I like it here. It's a pretty good place. And Hale says, Where? And then the, uh, the waiter comes to the table, and, um, he, uh, Klonoa asks for an incredibly long and complicated series of items, none of which are on the menu, and the waiter gets pissed off and leaves, and, uh, we still gotta make this creepy still, so, uh, 
Then uh, uh, Jason from uh, from Friday the 13th is uh, outside the restaurant and he taps on the window and he does that thing where like he points to his eyes with two fingers and then points to them sitting at the table and he does that a few times and uh, there you go, that's the end of it. Klonoa the Creepypasta. Thank <laughs> you.